Gather round, one and all. I have a festive tale to tell. It's the Christmas story, but not the one you know. You see, there are other versions out there, hidden ones, ones that are not included in the Bible, and perhaps for good reason. They're strange, very strange. From bizarre miracles to frightening monsters, these festive stories add new details to the nativity. Details that have long been overlooked. This is the Christmas story that never was. This is Christmas in the apocryphal Gospels. The biblical Christmas story is from the Gospels, the New Testament books about the life of Jesus. There are four Gospels in total, but only two of them describe Jesus's miraculous birth: Matthew and Luke. Each tells a very different version of the same story. Matthew's gospel has the bright star and the wise men. Luke's gospel has the chanting angels and the shepherds. Together, they make up one Christmas narrative. Despite the two versions, the biblical Christmas story is very short, only a few chapters or so combined. We also hear next to nothing about Jesus as a child. What else happened that fateful Christmas night? Enter the apocryphal Gospels, a group of Christian writings that didn't make it into the Bible. Many of them have their own versions of the Christmas story, like the infancy Gospel of Thomas, the history of Joseph the carpenter, and the amazingly named Proto Evangelium of James. They give us expanded accounts of the nativity. With some bonus details about Jesus as a child, they fill in the narrative gaps left by the Bible, a bit like biblical fan fiction. In fact, that's exactly what it is. The word apocryphal means something hidden. These gospels have been dismissed as either dubious or theologically controversial. Like the Gospel of Pseudo Matthew, a document that claims to be a long lost piece of Matthew's gospel. But what do these hidden stories actually say? What do the apocryphal gospels add to the Christmas story? Let's take a closer look at them and retell the birth of Jesus as told in these banned biblical books. Our story begins on the outskirts of Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph have just arrived in time for the Roman census. Mary is heavily pregnant. No surprise who the baby is. And Joseph is eager to find a midwife to help with the birth. Suddenly, the skies open up, and a mysterious angel descends from heaven. It tells Mary not to go to Bethlehem, and instead venture into that dark, gloomy cave over there. Without questioning this, Mary follows the angel's commands and proceeds into the cave. Joseph doesn't go with her, and instead heads into the town. In search of a midwife or two, Mary is left in the cave all by herself and tries to get comfortable on the cold, stony floor. All of a sudden, the cavern is filled with a glow that illuminates the surroundings. A baby miraculously appears on Mary's lap. It's Jesus. Only a few seconds old, he's able to stand fully upright. In the skies above the cave, the angels begin chanting and singing. Hailing the birth of the divine infant, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of good pleasure. Realizing he's just missed the birth of his child, Joseph rushes back into the cave. He's managed to find two midwives in Bethlehem, but it's a bit late now. Hey, at least he tried. The two midwives observe the newborn baby and are surprised that he's already able to walk. One of them, Salome, is not yet convinced this is the actual son of God. She walks over to Mary and inspects the child. As she continues to doubt the infant, her hand shrivels up and becomes withered. But baby Jesus gently touches her hand, and it's miraculously restored. Three days later, Mary takes the baby out of that dark cave and heads down to the nearest stable. Why? So a cow and a donkey can get a good look. Admittedly, it's an odd thing to do until you realize that it's meant to fulfill a prophecy from the Old Testament, Isaiah 1:3.
the ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. We are told that the animals are very happy to see Jesus. They, quote, adore him. That's nice. At this point, the story jumps ahead two years. Three wise men have come looking for Jesus. About time. The men bring gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh, just like in the Bible. But they also bring a few other things, specifically 12 commanders who bring a legion of a thousand soldiers each. Safe to say, things got a little crowded in Bethlehem that day. After the wise men and their armies leave, toddler Jesus goes for a stroll around the nearby caves, his anxious parents following closely behind. Out of the gloom comes a rumble, and a group of ferocious dragons appear. Unfazed in the slightest, toddler Jesus walks up over to them and smiles. The dragons are charmed by him and decide to slink back into the cave. This strange episode has just fulfilled another Old Testament prophecy. Psalm 148, 7. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps. This niche biblical reference is totally lost on Mary and Joseph. They're understandably shaken up by the whole ordeal. Toddler Jesus turns to them and slowly utters his first words. Be not afraid, and do not consider me to be a little child. For I am and have always been perfect, and all beasts of the forest must be tame before me. News of this eloquent dragon-taming toddler gets around town and soon arrives in the court of King Herod. He's nervous, especially as they've started to call him King of the Jews. To be on the safe side, Herod orders a massacre of all infants under the age of two. Actually, this bit's in the Bible as well, but it's too dark to feature in any of the songs. Just like the Bible story, Mary, Joseph and Jesus flee Bethlehem for Egypt. Things get apocryphal again when they arrive at an orchard en route. Swaying in the breeze is a tree with delicious looking fruit. Trouble is, it's out of reach. Toddler Jesus hops off Mary's lap and begins speaking again. O tree, bend thy branches and refresh thy mother with thy fruit. As if it were a Christmas miracle, the tree obeys Jesus and curls down. Mary plucks its fruit and is replenished by the well-needed snack. And with that, our apocryphal Christmas story comes to an end. The apocryphal gospels follow the basic plot of the biblical nativity. A baby is born in miraculous circumstances, men show up with gifts, and a massacre of infants takes place. These stories featuring dungeons and dragons add all sorts of curious details to the main story. Shame none of them are considered official. That said, have you noticed the illustrations I've been using throughout this video? Artworks that seem to be based on the apocryphal gospels. Like this Renaissance painting where baby Jesus is standing upright. Or this German manuscript of toddler Jesus taming a dragon. What about this stained glass? of the tree giving Mary its fruit. Somehow, details from the apocryphal gospels have snuck into depictions of the Christmas story. Why? These stories aren't in the Bible, so what are they doing in biblical art? Throughout the history of Christianity, these apocryphal stories were very popular. In fact, they were often read alongside the Bible, particularly the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew that non-biblical book attempting to pass off as a lost piece of the original. In medieval Europe, many believed that it was actually part of the Bible. Its tales of dragons, talking babies, and obedient trees were mistakenly seen as canonical. It was, quite literally, read as gospel. These bonus details are not part of the biblical canon, but they are part of the visual canon. Imagine a nativity scene without a stable, or a cow and donkey. There's no mention of any of these in the biblical version, but they are still commonly found in religious art. And not just in the medieval era, elements from these apocryphal gospels have been found on Roman carvings dating to 385 AD. 
Next time you go to a school nativity and see children dressed up as these animals, politely remind those around you that they are not biblically accurate. If we're going to include apocryphal creatures, where's the kid dressed up like a dragon? The official Christmas story in the Bible is very brief, so delving into these unofficial texts reveal colourful extra details. It's biblical fanfiction after all. Who doesn't like learning about their favourite heroes from the Christian scriptural universe? Nowadays, we've largely forgotten that these hidden stories even exist. But they've always been there, especially in religious art. Had the apocryphal gospels been included in the Bible, they would have dramatically changed how the Christmas story is told. Christmas has always been a mishmash of a bunch of festive traditions. The date, December 25th, is taken from an ancient Roman festival, decorated pine trees from Baltic paganism, and a Yule log from the Vikings. With such a multicultural and collaborative myth as Christmas, it's nice to know these amazingly underrated stories have a place at the table. And that concludes my festive tale. But before you go, I come bearing a gift. Have you ever wanted to hear more from me? Like, say, an eight-episode investigative podcast? Well, you're in luck. Introducing The Interruption. It's all about a strange incident in 1977 where television sets across southern England were hijacked by a mysterious voice. A voice claiming to be from outer space. This is the voice of Allah. For 45 years, it has remained unsolved. Well, until now. You can listen to The Interruption right now, wherever you get your podcasts. Links are down below. It's a truly absurd story, and I think you're going to love it. A little gift from me to you. Apocryphally yours, Hochelago. Hey, thanks for watching. I had a great time making this, and I hope you enjoyed it too. If you like this video and want to see more, why not subscribe? A like and a comment also go a really long way. Oh, and do check out the channel's merch over at Crowdmade. We have beanies, t-shirts, and hoodies. Links are in the description down below. I look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.